Okay. Okay, so let's go to the second speak, uh, speaker of the session and the final speaker of the day. <clears throat> Our speaker is uh, Maria, Professor Maria Diorio, Diorio, who's a professor of uh, biostatistics at the National University of Singapore in the School of Medicine, as well as being a member of ASTAR, and uh, is uh, uh, as a joint appointment with the University uh, Department of Statistical Science, Statistical Science at University College London. Um, Maria used to have had positions, has held positions uh, at Imperial College London, both in math and in the School of Medicine, uh, after uh, doing her postdoc in Oxford. And she's going to speak on Bayesian computation and learning of substructures in Gaussian graphical models. Please take it away, Maria, and thank you. Okay, thank you for the introduction. I'm sorry I lost my voice, but hopefully you can hear me. And uh, I don't know why there is... Okay, it disappeared. Okay, good. And thank you for inviting me and congratulations. You have a beautiful campus. It doesn't even look like a university. It looks more like a resort, very different from what I'm used. So thank you. It's been really nice going around. And uh, this is work. Um, so it's now many years that I work in the field of gas and graphical models. And today my talk is um, divided sort in two parts. The first part is about an MCMC algorithm that in theory speeds up combination for estimation and posterior inference of gas and graphical models. And the second part of the talk is about, it's a bit more um, kind of inferential problem. It's something I've been interested for uh, quite a few years now that, uh, um, and it involves so the uh, inference on substructures, so subgraph uh, into a bigger graph. And I'll tell you more and why I wanna do this. Okay. So this is a joint work if, oh, okay. I can't change the slide, let's. Okay. So this is, okay. This is joint work with my postdoc, Willem Van, uh, Van der Boom, who is at NUS and uh, with Alex Bascos, which is in University College London, and I believe many of you might have met him when he visited here. And, um, and basically, I think he's giving also a talk tomorrow. But for some unknown reason, this thing doesn't change slide, okay? Sorry. Shall I try the PDF instead of the PowerPoint? As it also with you, so it's not me. Are we trying to do that? I think it's that. Mm -hmm. Maybe a moment. You do screen, and that usually works better. Just open the video. And this is it. Yeah, this works better. Okay, so we got that to the co-authors. Okay, so what are we trying to do here? This is a basically a brief overview of my talk. And um, as you might know, most of you know, so the graphical models are a very powerful uh, uh, model to describe the depend conditional dependent structure of a set of multivariate data. And they've been applied everywhere, obviously, my background, with my background, the most of application I'm interested in is a, a biomedical application. But lately, I mean, Alex has forced me against my will in a way uh, to do some application also in finance, but the applicability of Gaussian graphical model is much broader. And if you look at inferential method for Gaussian graphical model, usually they put most of the focus in the estimation of a single edge in a graph. So you have a graph, you would like to recover its structure, 
So the graph in it, in, it's a latent variable, basically. And you try to estimate the graph structure from a set of multivariate data. So in each node in the graph would correspond to a random variable. And obviously, I work with Gaussian graphical models, so you assume that the distribution of the data is a, Gaussian, is a multivariate Gaussian. And um, the problem when you focus uh, uh, your inferential, um, uh, when your inferential goal is mainly on edges, uh, sometimes the interpretation of a single edge in a graph is quite difficult. And um, by in a Bayesian framework, actually, uh, you can you can use easily use a Bayesian framework to go beyond the, the single edge instead try to infer macrostructure within the graph. So, for example, in my little cartoon, you might interested more into the blue dots connection and the red dots connection and the green dots connect green dots connection more than just a single edge between two nodes. So that's what we would like to do. The problem is like if. <coughs> If you want to make a full posterior inference with um, MCMC, say also sequential Monte Carlo, many methods, full posterior inference is becomes extremely challenging when the number of nodes is quite big, also, also when the number of observation. And by big, sometimes I mean 100 nodes, which is not very big by a nowadays standard. So but if you want to make for full posterior inference, then becomes quite challenged. So in, uh, in this talk, quite, quite challenging, I will uh, focus on two, on some work we have done, both in terms of contribution to MCMC scheme to, um, to perform posterior inference on a graph space. And uh, we propose what we call the, the WWA uh, algorithm, which is a wishart weighted proposal algorithm. And this type of algorithm can be easily parallelized, offering obviously some computational advantages. And then probably the part I like a bit better of this talk is like uh, to infer large scale uh, substructure applying uh, through specifying a prior that uses a very famous construction in uh, uh, random graph theory, which are stochastic block model. And uh, in general, especially for the application I'm interested in, large scale substructure are much more um, interpretable. And, uh, and I'm not obviously the only one going into this direction, but there are other people obviously in the literature that focus themselves on large scale substructure. Because once you have a set of nodes which are connected in some way, interpretation in, is easy. So you can think about a gene module for gene expression data, or for example, metabolic pathway in modern uh, uh, metabolomic data. So the, uh, the meaning of uh, this big, uh, at least in the application I've seen, but I believe also in finance with sectors, uh, the meaning of this large scale substructure from uh, an interpretation point of view is much, uh, is much easier. So, so these are the two contributions I'm gonna go through today. So the first one, as I said, is, uh, this, uh, is uh, this algorithm, which we refer to as uh, WWA. This algorithm is still an MCMC algorithm, which uh, builds on uh, recent advances, uh, advances in the literature, in the Markov chain literature. I'm sorry, one small question, just to be sure. You mentioned some medical applications. What, what, what we are looking for? Do we, it's classification problem or we predict one number? No, we try to, we look for a graph reconstruction. So you don't see the graph, you don't observe the network, and you try to reconstruct, estimate the graph from uh, from the multivariate data. Yes, I agree, but it's in mathematical language, but if a medical doctor, I need just to know if patient is sick or not, or something like this. Yeah, no, this, we are not, so actually, actually, you're not gonna see it today, mm -hmm. but we have used, um, this type of graphical models to identify uh, to cloud to identify ri um, risk subgroups so you can do that at the end of the day so by the connection by the type of connection you see in the graph you can help identifying risk subgroup at the end you can we can do that you're just not gonna show so it to I you today put this graph yeah large so this talk for this talk, it's just about the inference in the graph. There is no, and some example. But yes, we have done it. I'm not just gonna speak about it today, which it's a, it's actually been quite challenging to use pathways 
to identify risk subgroups. So, but the focus here is on the inference on the graph. So, uh, again, just for better for understanding. This talk, for this talk, I mean. Can you please repeat what is input and what is output? Just... Multivariate data. Okay. I, I'm In... going to speak a bit more about it. Uh, don't worry. So input is multivariate data. Multivariate data. So you have a matrices. Mm -hmm. uh, each observation is a random, is a vector of, say, P random variable. So, and you assume each of these, you have an observation on P random variables. The, vec the P dimensional vector has a multivariate Gaussian distribution. And you have an observation uh, on this multivariate vector. And then you try to recover the precision matrix or co co mat uh, covariance matrix, however you want to say it. Ah, so we inference. But conditional on a graph. We inference uh, parameters of covariance matrix. So no, here, because you will see, okay. here we are in the Bayesian framework, we're going to specify the, the prior on the precision matrix conditional on the graph. So you have a prior there, you have an hierarchical prior, and then you're going to specify a prior on graph space. We don't work. We work uh, on the precision matrix conditional on the graph. Mm -hmm. But you're right. There are approaches that ignore the graph, estimate the covariance of the precision matrix, whatever you prefer in life, that they threshold the elements and, uh, and then graph becomes a pi byproduct. But in, uh, in, a co in a full Bayesian, in most of Bayesian uh, papers instead specify a prior on graph space. And that's the approach I am okay, taking thank today. Thank you very much for clarification. Is it yeah, yeah, clear? Thank you. I mean, mm -hmm. Yeah. But you, I'll, I'll go through it a bit more in detail. Okay. So uh, anyway, so the first, uh, the first thing is about performing posterior inference through an, M an MCMC algorithm. So in general, why inference in graphical models is difficult? Because uh, given a P nodes, so P random variable, there are two to the power of P times P minus one over two possible graph that you can draw on P nodes. And in general, I'm really bad in combinatorics, but of this one, I'm pretty sure. And if you look at the literature, like the literature is really full of proposal on how to estimate, make inference in the graph, both in the frequencies framework and in the Bayesian framework. I think among the frequencies approaches proposed in the literature, I believe, but I might be wrong, by far, the most popular one are the, those based on the lasso method, like uh, the graphical lasso, and uh, which basically is a shrinkage, esti is a penalized estimation on the uh, on the precision matrix. Sometimes they use also the covariance matrix, obviously, and then what happens? So you get an estimation of uh, uh, the precision matrix, so a maximum like a penalized maximum likelihood estimation of the precision matrix, and then you do some thresholding according to your arbitrary threshold, setting some elements to zero and some elements uh, different from zero, and then basically you get as a byproduct uh, the graph. But you don't work in this kind of uh, in this um, in this kind of uh, framework directly on the graph. You work on the precision, and then you choose your threshold, then you get the graph. Then there is another, uh, a bit less popular approach, which is called node-wise regression, which once again, uh, it's not probabilistically, it doesn't give you a probabilistically nice model, means, meaning uh, it's not really, you don't get a, a, a probabilistic consistent joint model, for, uh, joint model, but it's amazingly fast. I'm not going to go in details on it, but it's amazingly fast and it's parallelizable. And so people like it because, uh, because, um, because of that. But once again, you need to apply some thresholding to recover the graph. It's a model on a, uh, on a sort of covariance matrix, but still it's uh, arbitrary. And then you can go, there are actually other proposals in the literature, in the Bayesian literature, there are uh, application of the spike slab prior, both on the covariance and the precision is very fast and it's very, uh, and it works quite well. But then if you look really at a lot of Bayesian literature, what they do is to prefer, instead of working on uh, the covariance uh, and precision directly, they work first of all on graph space, so they, uh, they elicit a prior on the space of all possible graph, then, um, and, uh, and then they try to perform a posterior inference where the focus of self of the inferential task is the graph. And the graph is not anymore a byproduct 
of some thresholding of the precision metrics. Now, the problem is like, uh, it's a very hard space to explore, it's a huge discrete space. And uh, the first proposal uh, in, um, in the literature were dealing only with uh, the composable graph, which is, as, which is a subset of graph. This type of graph, it's easy to work computationally because uh, there are a lot of analytical results available. Unfortunately, they are not very, um, I mean, they, are, they, are, they, are, they, they, they require strong, strong assumption that usually are not um, really valid in application. So what's most common nowadays is to work with the GB sharp prior, which I'm going to explain a bit more later. And, um, and there are many, which is a conjugate prior for uh, graphs, uh, for the precision metrics, sorry. And, um, and there are many proposals in the literature based on the GB sharp prior. The um, two of the most famous ones are the one implemented in BD graph, which is an R package, and then the double conditional ba uh, base factor sampler, which I believe maybe probably are the biggest two competitors. So how do we improve uh, uh, existing MCMC scheme? It's like we enrich them by building on two proposals in the MCMC literature. The first one we, we, uh, we incorporate in, uh, in uh, MCMC for graphs, the informed proposal, uh, uh, which is being proposed by Zanella, for exploring discrete space. And then we in um, then we include a delayed metropolis est esting acceptance step. And I'll see uh, I'll show you how this will um, will uh, will will help us will help us speeding up computation. So this is very simple. Suppose this is a, a very uh, very simply what's uh, the setup of um, a Gaussian graphical model. So we have data, yi, in my cartoon, a three-dimensional vector. So you have data one, on uh, three variables, and you assume that your random vector has um, a Gaussian distribution with, uh, with precision omega and uh, with precision omega. Now, the, the, given the graph and the precision, we will see that there is a one-one correspondence between the precision matrix and the graph. So basically what the graph does, it, it helps us to specify the conditional dependent structure among the variable. So you can see here we have a graph with three, with three nodes and only two edges, the one that connects one, two, and two to three. So what happens? If you don't see an edge within the graph, it means that the two variables, so in this case one and three, are conditionally independent given all the remaining variable in, this gra in the graph, which is uh, in this case only variable two. Okay, so but uh, the the reason um, uh, the the reason is like uh, that we say here. Sorry, instead of k it should be omega. That the distribution of y is conditional to k and g is that once we have uh, we know g, that we know that in the, the corresponding element in the precision matrix. So the element in this case that corresponds to one and three are equal to zero. So every time there, is a, there isn't an edge in the graph, then there is a, a zero element in the precision matrix. Every time there is an edge in the graph, then there is a non-zero element in the precision matrix and vice versa. So you can define a prior on the precision matrix conditional on the graph, okay? And so basically this prior will enforce that every time I see, I don't see an edge in the graph, I will have a zero in the precision matrix. And this is a very standard setup in a Gaussian graphical mode. I'm sorry, small question. So graph is given at the beginning. Yeah? Now we put a prior. Now we put a prior on the graph. We are getting there. No, graph is not given. Otherwise I wouldn't have to infer it if it was given. So we have put a, a, a so the space of graph is two to the has got two to the power of p times p minus one over two elements, right? My prior on the precision is defined conditional on the graph, but now I'm going to put a prior on the graph. So our task is to build graph on the fly, yeah? Not exactly on the fly, but yes. Okay. I mean, it's to estimate the graph, yes, okay. on the fly. I like this expression. I wish I could do it on the fly. The reality takes a lot of computation, <laughs> but yeah. So, so as... Um, as um, uh, sorry, uh, sorry. So now we're going to specify a prior on 
or a joint prior on, uh, on, on the precision matrix and the graph, as is usually done in a Bayesian literature. I'm not doing anything new here. And the, the usual, uh, if we are going to use the usual hierarchical prior, uh, which specify first a prior on the graph, whatever you like in life, more or less, and then a prior on the precision matrix, given the graph where there is this condition, where there is, there is no edge, then there is a zero in the, um, in the, in the element corresponding to the two nodes without an edge. So in um, the standard conjugate prior on the precision matrix, given the graph is uh, the GV shirt distribution, which exactly uh, uh, allows for this condition that the elements are equal to zero when there is no edge in the graph. And so this is uh, the shape of, uh, of uh, the conditional, uh, sorry, of the GV shirt distribution. And as I said, this is a conjugate prior. So given the Y as a multivariate normal distribution with mean zero and, and precision omega, then it's easy to do the um, omega given the posterior distribution given G and Y is still a GV shirt distribution with updated parameters. So this is standard Bayesian machinery. So given the graph and Y, you can easily get the posterior for omega. Okay, so by reality, we are interested in the graph. That's where we want to put our posterior inference. And so, since uh, the GV shirt is also, sorry, it's, it's conjugate, then we have uh, what? That uh, in reality, what we want to know is the posterior distribution on the graph given Y, most application, because we want to recover um, uh, the graph structure. And this is proportional to the prior times likelihood, okay, which in this case is PDY given G. PDY given G can be analytically evaluated. So it's just the integral of the Gaussian likelihood with respect to the G Wisher distribution. And it's got a nice cross form solution. The only problem of this, of that cross form solution, is that uh, the normalizing constant is intractable unless you're working with the decomposable graph. And so, makes posterior computation uh, difficult because you need to evaluate the normalizing constant. And then you can go in the literature and there are many proposals also including how to approximate the ratio of normalizing constant. What's delta? Sorry? What's delta? Ah, delta, uh, one is um, the degree of freedom of the uh, visual distribution and uh, D is, is a base ma matrix. matrix. There are, two, the there are two parameters of the GV shirt. Similar to the Vischer distribution, this is just a bit more complicated. Okay, so what's, okay, what's the problem uh, with the making posterior inference here? First of all, it's actually very expensive to simulate from a GV shirt distribution. And here we improve by using IPS update based on the Cholesky decomposition of um, the precision matrix. Then, as we said, the discrete space of graphs is quite big. And then, and then we hear to, to help us exploring better the graph space, we use the informed proposal, which, uh, uh, which I will describe more in details. And then, as I said before, a lot of, uh, when you work on such big discrete space, you spend a lot of time rejecting graphs that are no good. And to correct this, we basically, we introduce this delayed acceptance for which we pass to the next step. We reject fast, very bad graphs, and we only move a potentially good graph to a proper metropolis acceptance, and we'll see later. So just uh, all these algorithms lately, I think this exchange algorithm has become very popular because, uh, because it avoids computing, uh, the um, evaluating the normalizing constant, which is, uh, which is intractable. And so this has already been applied to graph, uh, to, to posterior inference for graph. And the idea of, uh, of uh, the exchange algorithm is to work on an augmented space. So instead of um, imagine a standard um, MCMC algorithm, you are, you are in a current state G, and then you propose G tilde, your new graph, and then you do the standard MCMC acceptance, which is uh, unfortunately hindered by the fact that you cannot evaluate the normalizing constants. Here, what they do, you work 
on once again, you propose a new graph G tilde, but you work on an augmented space. So you draw also an auxiliary variable, in this case, the precision metric omega tilde zero from the prior distribution. And you work on the space of omega G, which is sort of your current state, then omega tilde and G tilde, which is in a way a um, the, your proposed state, G tilde. And basically what happens here that this kind of augmented space has the correct marginal, which is that you're interested in, which is P of G given Y. And um, what happens here is like, since you work on this augmented space, so the probability distribution, the condition of uh, the posterior probability distribution of the, this augmented space is proportional to P of G of omega given Y times P of tilde given G tilde, because oh, this auxiliary variable is basically drawn from the prior. Now, when you go and calculate uh, the acceptance ratio for your uh, G tilde, for your proposed state, you just swap, uh, basically, or you just swap G tilde and G, okay? And you basically get that expression. The important thing here is to notice that in this expression, and without going through all the details, you have a P omega given G at the denominator and a P omega tilde given G at the numerator, so the normalizing constant cancel out. Same trick for P omega G tilde and P omega zero given G tilde. And so this trick cancel out the normalizing constant and uh, it makes computation, uh, uh, I mean, and, and, and bypass the problem of evaluating it. So, but the problem is that still, Sampling uh, omega from a GV shirt is computationally very expensive. And I think at a certain point we tried to make the sampler uh, more efficient, but we didn't. We failed, I would say, right? I think we did. So now, so we just stuck with the Gibbs update for uh, for the uh, for the element uh, for one because still we can allow only one change at a time. In the, in the graph, so just one change, uh, one um, edge change in the graph. If you only allow one edge change in the graph, then you can exploit the Cholesky so, so decomposition of uh, the precision metrics by reordering the, elem the elements. You basically can do some Gibbs update for, um, for the element that is changing the Cholesky composition due to a change in the graph. So this is quite technical, but basically this is a quite efficient Gibbs step. So um, the other thing that uh, that we are going to do is to use the informed proposal. Now, this informed proposal is basically uh, makes faster uh, or more efficient in a way exploring uh, the large uh, discrete space of graph. Now, if you look once again, MCMC, MCMC algorithm for a graph, they usually don't go blind. Before, they basically usually, their proposal always include a scan of a neighboring set of the graph. Usually the neighboring set is the set of all the graph that differ from the current graph by only one edge. And usually sometimes they use some sort of uniform proposal. The informed proposal of Zanella instead basically bias the proposal of distribution towards towards a graph that have a posterior probability by introducing, so Q, G tilde given G is your favorite standard proposal for graph, but then you are gonna balance it, we are gonna bias it by introducing this function G, which is called balancing function, that is a function of the posterior probability of the new graph and, and uh, of the new graph and the current graph. Now, in the original formulation, you would have to include as argument of G, P of G tilde given Y. But it doesn't work for us because um, the, uh, the normalizing constant is intractable. So we need to modify the original idea of Zanella. And we, uh, we use as argument P of mega and uh, G as, uh, as input uh, given Y, obviously, as input to the, to the, um, to the balancing function. And uh, here, instead of using, uh, so once again, here we run into the problem of the normalizing constant, but we solve it uh, to in, in the interest of speed by using approximation instead of the full exchange algorithm. And the other uh, improvement we have done compared uh, to, w, to, to, to previous approaches is to introduce this delayed acceptance. Because what happens, once again, once you go to the acceptance step that uh, 
that requires uh, with the exchange algorithm, you need to simulate from the prior, which is, uh, which is uh, computationally expensive. So you really want to send to this final acceptance step graph that are that have a good chance to be promoted. And so what we do is to create a delay that, so first of all, we, we, we scan the graph through an approximate acceptance. And then if it survives this first acceptance step, we send it to the final acceptance step, which requires the exchange algorithm and simulating from the GVCHAR distribution. So this is it. I just give, this is a lot of, things and this is finally an overview of the entire algorithm and uh, basically we propose g from the informed proposal then uh, we update uh, omega tilde by a gibbs update uh, which uh, involves the cholesky the composition we promote g uh, g tilde using uh, an approximate delayed acceptance uh, an approximate sorry mcmc acceptance and then if the graph is promoted we send it to the final acceptance if we accept the graph then also um, we accept the precision matrix and uh, the good thing about this type of algorithm that the informed proposal is easily parallelizable and once again, for this type of algorithm is a sampling from the GV shirt, which is still painful. But now we only do it when um, G tilde survives uh, the first acceptance uh, round in a way. Okay. So is this algorithm good? So just here very briefly, because I don't know how much time I've left. Oh, okay. Well, at least like I guess speak all day. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not gonna speak all day, I promise you. No, no. So just no. Hmm? Uh, yeah, yeah, all uh, uh so just uh, to compare it with existing algorithm, well, I'm gonna just look at the um, cost of an independent uh, I'm gonna compare the computational cost and the efficiency of the MCMC in terms of mixing an effective sample size, and it does work okay. And I'm just gonna show you result by presenting the cost of an independent sample, which is the number of MCMC step over the effective sensor si sample size times the cost per step, like the time in employed for an iteration. So, and we compare because we consider it the state of the art to the double conditional base factor sampler. And, um, and basically, you can see that uh, we do quite well. We are the blue one, and the double conditional base factor sampler is uh, is um, is in orange, I think. And you can see that independently of the number of nodes, we outperform the algorithm. So this is a just uh, a conceptual comparison of the MCMC. So. We basically, we, we sample from uh, the right stationary distribution. We're not sampling from an approximate distribution. If you employ approximation of the ratio, sometimes you do sample from an approximation, uh, from an approximate distribution. You can see not all the algorithm do it. We also, we have reduced computational cost as, uh, as I told you, mainly due to the Gibbs update for Omega. And then, as I said, also this algorithm is uh, quite uh, parallelizable. And also BD graph of um, Muhammadi and Witt is quite parallelized, is parallelizable, but the other algorithm cannot be, par uh, the most, say, popular algorithm in the literature are not. And so this is all I wanted to tell you about computation. And now I'm gonna speak about how we use this machinery then to make inference to learn about uh, substructure in a graph. Um, so, the, if you look at the literature, there are two big fields which are real complementary but uh, and related. One is Gaussian graphical model, and we've seen it until now. I've gave you a review, a very small review, and the focus is on inference on the graph. But then in mathematics, in mathematics, in discrete mathematics, there is another huge field, which is random graph theory. And random graph theory, like the Erdo-Renyi graph or, or, other, or other type of model, 
like the one we look at it today, stochastic block model. Basically, they try to explain graph evolution, so how connections are made in a graph. And um, if you look about practical application of random graph theory to data, usually the network is observed in those applications. And what people try to do is they assume a model from random graph theory for this particular network, and people try to, re to estimate the parameters that govern this model. So in, one, in the first, in the Gaussian graphical model, you try to recover the graph structure, while in random graph theory, you have the network and you are trying to you assume an evolutionary model for your network and you at most try to estimate the parameters that, uh, that govern, that determine your, um, your um, uh, that characterize basically the evolutionary network model of your choice. So these are quite complementary literature. So now I think many years ago, Jay and I try to use prior that come from graph theory to aid the graph, uh, from, uh, that come from random graph theory literature and to make it as prior distribution for, uh, for graphs in a graphical model setups. So sort of we try to borrow idea from random graph, uh, random graph theory and um, to, to uh, help inference on a Gaussian graphical model. And so that's what we're gonna do also here today. I'm using the stochastic block model to make inference uh, to make inference in um, on um, on graph substructure. So this is basically what I'm gonna do. Okay, and so basically, instead of um, my inferential effort to be focused on a single edge, it's um, I'm gonna focus on big structure. Now, for anybody who's trying to estimate a graph. Basically, single edge estimation is very sensitive to number of nodes in the graph, sample size, strength of correlation. So it's really, really, so by inserting one node or not, you can actually change more than you think the structure of the inferred graph. Why, um, so that's why I think there is also a, an advantage in application to look at the, a bigger structure and not only at single edges because they're actually much more robust. Then, so not only, not only they're more robust, they're, they're easier to interpret. And uh, also like in a way when they make exploration of the space a bit easier because uh, you are putting more structure on the graph space. So you're sort of, you know, where, you know slightly better where you are going. So in this talk, we are gonna use a stochastic block model as a prior on graph space. And, um, just for people, so this stochastic block model is a construction which comes from random graph theory, okay? So we take this model and we use it as a prior for, uh, for graph space. So what, uh, they are very intuitive stochastic block model. Suppose you have a set of nodes and uh, if two people are, um, are um, belong to the same block or community, then they are more likely to have an edge. Now think about a standard network. I think you have million of, uh, of, of example of these people go uh, living in the same city, obviously they are more likely to be friends or, um, or things like that in general, people, students from the same university. So there are usually this community structure in a set of multivariate data. And so people that belong to the same community are more likely to have a connection. Uh, this type of, um, so we're gonna look for this structure and what we are going to do, we are going to use these are non-parametric uh, tools to identify block structure in a, in a set of multivariate data coupled with a block uh, with a stochastic block model. And uh, I, uh, we we build on an, an old model of mine, very old now, which is um, which I developed with a very good post postdoc, Linda Tan in NUS, which was quite efficient computationally, and allow and allows for uh, data driven clustering of the nodes. Because basically, when you speak about uh, a block model on a graph, you are clustering nodes. Most of you might be familiar with the idea of clustering individual, but reality here uh, we are actually clustering nodes on a graph. And if you look at the literature. Usually, most of people that try to estimate community, the number of community, they think no, to, to recover communities in, um, in a set of data, 
they assume none of the number of uh, communities. But since we're using based on non-parametric, we actually can also make inference on the number of, uh, of communities or blocks in the graph. So just to be a bit more concrete, so this is, uh, if you think about the usual prior on graph, people just estimate, uh, the, the usual prior on graph would tell you, uh, the, given an edge between two nodes, the probability that there is an edge between two nodes is some value P. And then they choose P according to their desired level of shrinkage. Here instead, the we are gonna, as I said, we are gonna transfer the random graph, the stochastic block model. Uh, we're gonna use the stochastic block model as a prior for, for, for the graph so that the probability that uh, the prior probability that there is an edge between node i and j is a function of two things. Is a, it's just a probability model, okay? But it's a function of two of, uh, say, two parameters, a popularity parameter, in that case, a theta is just me being a bit uh, lazy, it's theta i plus theta j. So a popularity parameters, which is idiosyncratic to each node, so I, each node has its own propensity to make friends, say, to make connection. But then another parameter, which is much more of interest here, it's uh, an interaction parameter, beta ij, which only is activated if two nodes belong to the same community. So here, zeta is an allocation variable. It's an allocation indicator that tells me to which community a node i belongs to. So if two nodes have have um, belong to the same community, then the probability of having a connection increases by factor beta ij. Now, what's the trick here? How do we estimate community? And how, uh, and how do we estimate people uh, that belong to the nodes that belong to same, the same community? We're gonna use, I guess, arguably the most popular Bayesian on parametric prior, which is the Dirichlet process, which is basically, um, um, a model of random probability distribution. And it's very popular in application just because first of all, it's very computationally efficient, but also it's because it's almost surely discrete. So basically you can rewrite H if H as a digital process distribution can be rewritten as a, a countably mixture of point masses and basically allows for ties in the data because this is a discrete distribution. So the trick is here, is, is basically we introduce these latent parameters beta i, each of them associated to each node. Then we cluster the node. If two nodes have the same beta i, it means that they belong to the same community. And then we set beta i j equal to beta i equal to beta j. This is a quite uh, nice trick. Uh, obviously we didn't come up with it. Somebody else came up with it, but we recycle it here and allows us uh, to to, to basically partition the nodes into community. And uh, for people who don't know, the Dirichlet process is extremely, although it shouldn't, but it's extremely successful, successful as a clustering tool. And, um, and, and, uh, and basically also allows for data-driven clustering in the sense that I do not have to assume a priori the number of community in the data. And then posterior inference is the usual, but here not only you're interested in the graph and recovering the graph, but also to estimate the vector zeta that tells me the allocation of nodes to different communities. And then this is the usual Bayesian posterior, and you can make posterior inference exploiting also the WWA. Now, this is a very simple example, which is to mutual fund data. There are 86 observations on 59 mutual fund, and we want to recover the, the structure to see if our result makes sense. So there is a natural grouping of these observations depending on which in, sector this fund invests for, invest in. And basically, uh, there are uh, four, sec four sectors. And uh, we, we can see if actually our algorithm managed to recover this block structure. So we are gonna look at marginal inference of, on, uh, on, uh, on inference on zeta given y, and we can look at it in different ways. So we can look at the possible probability of two of, two of these uh, mutual fund belonging to the same block. We can get a point estimation of the partition or a median probability graph, which is the graph whose edges have a probability above 0 0.5 to be 
uh, a possible probability of inclusion above 0 0.5. So you can see this is on the left, the posterior similarity matrix. And you can see that uh, more or less on uh, we recover the, the, the structure in terms of which sector they invest in. And is a quite, uh, you can see the first block corresponds to, to funds that invest in US bonds. And so this is quite, uh, uh, quite um, so we do quite well, basically. The big graph with a lot of connection is the median graph, posterior graph. And the colors of the nodes depend once again on the, on the sector they invest in. And then we highlight some of the connection within each, uh, each block, estimated block. And so you can see that this thing more or less work. So the other uh, structure you can impose is what we call Southern Italian community structure. Because in the previous construction, if you belong to the same node, uh, to the same block, you do not necessarily need to have uh, an edge. You might also belong to the same community but not having an edge. Here in the Southern Italian community structure, uh, which we call like this because for people who don't know, if you go in a Southern Italian village, everybody knows each other and they know everything about you. And uh, yes, so that's where I got the name from my life. Uh, basically, um, in a Southern Italian community structure, if you belong to the nodes belonging to the same community, we'll have always an edge between them, okay? So we force an edge between every pair of nodes within the same community. And so each block is a click. And uh, I didn't know, I found out by, by working on this, that actually this is the way block, stochastic block model were originally proposed. And uh, this type of structure is uh, desirable in application when blocks have uh, clicks in, uh, have a meaning is that like, for example, in protein protein interaction networks. Here, the MCMC is a bit more challenging because every time you change block membership, you don't change only one edge in the graph. You might end up changing a lot of edges in the graph, which is extremely painful. And so we had to devise uh, some special um, a special mover to move on that space. And this is like on the on the on the fund data we try to fit the southern Italian community structure. Obviously you can see here is not the best model for the data because you require all the connection. And so but you can see is actually the reason of this figure is to show you which is actually a very different modeling strategy from a standard stochastic block model. And then sometimes in application you think is a block structure actually a reasonable uh, model for my data? And, um, or oh, maybe I'm overcomplicating my life. And then actually there is only one graph without blocks and nodes form connection just, just by being popular, just on the basis of the popularity parameter. In that case, we have devised on, um, you can actually compute a base factor to compare the hypothesis that yes, there is block structure versus the hypothesis, no, look, it's just one graph without blocks. And uh, the way we compute the base factor is by exploiting the savage dicky ratio, which allows you to, to basically to exploit M MCMC outputs. There are other approaches, like you could run many chains and get a much better approximation of the base factor, but that's very painful. There is the harmonic mean approaches, but I never liked it, so forget it. So, and in this case, it's easy because you are comparing the, the model where zeta basically comes from a Dirichlet process prior versus the model of uh, with only with no blocks. So basically, your location vector is fixed to the same value for every node. So everybody belongs to one block, which is the graph. And you can easily calculate the base factor. Basically, you want to compare, as in any base factor, the marginal likelihood, uh, the, li the marginal likelihood of y given zeta star, which is no block, versus the marginal likelihood of y given zeta, where zeta then comes from the Dirichlet process prior, so block structure. This can be easily simplified because obviously you can integrate over the zeta, uh, p of zeta, sorry. Uh, and then basically by very simple simplification, you get that the base factor is P of zeta star given Y over P of zeta. So the prior on this, on, on zeta star. 
Now the, num the numerator, the denominator solely is usually analytical, while uh, the numerator you can evaluate from your MCMC output. And so you can actually even do this game. And the last thing I want to present is like, uh, which is why I started to do, uh, I started to be interested in taking idea of random, uh, from random graph theory and import them in gas uh, graphical literature, because a lot, especially in biomedical application, you, uh, you want, you have many, uh, many groups of, there is a natural grouping of observation, like for example, disease and non-disease, very simple, cancer, no cancer, or cancer type. And so actually you want to compare graphs built under this condition, which are basically, um, given by the problem. So you want to see the difference in this condition uh, or conditional independent structure between different groups. Because if you look at metabolic pathway, people who are obese and non-obese, for example, um, actually have a, many, have different biochemical reaction going, in, going on into their body. So this is something that uh, that um, that I, that I've always been interested in, and obviously, if you look at the literature, most applied literature is they just estimate different graphs, so they reduce the sample size and then they compare as if they were independent sample. In reality, most of the time there is some shared structure, and so you don't you you want to actually estimate both the shear structure across condition, as well as the structure of graphs, which are part peculiar to one particular condition. So that's why there is uh, a lot of interest in a joint inference of multiple graph. And I think by using uh, these models from ran gra random graph theory helps a lot in facilitating inference because there are other models in the literature which are much more complex than what we are doing and much more difficult to make uh, to make inference in. So what we do here to make inference of multiple graph is to extend the, the, the non-parametric prior that we have used before to this setup of multiple graph using a, a construction which is called, uh, a, a, a generalizing a construction which is called dependent Dirichlet process. And uh, we need to generalize it because we cannot employ vanilla dependent Dirichlet process because uh, uh, basically we need, uh, the, we cannot really enforce exchangeability within groups. But here I don't want to become too technical on this. And just very simply, we suppose you have two group control and disease. You pick one group as baseline, say, the, oh, sorry, the control group. Okay, so x equal one here is my baseline group, and you cluster individual in that group, so you have a nice z allocation for uh, for um, you you get your um, your allocation in blocks for the nodes in group one x equal one say control, and once again here you're assumed exactly as I said before that the allocation that the allocation so the beta i the interaction parameters come from a Dirichlet process but now when you define the prior for the allocation in groups and the, in the uh, for the allocation in, in blocks sorry not in groups for the other group say x equal 2 so for the disease group then you do it conditionally on the allocation in the baseline category so the control group so two nodes in the second group in the group x equal two, I have a probability that uh, belong to the same group as in group one, as uh, which is a mixture between a po basically I'm, I'm making it more complicated, but basically you look at, uh, you take two nodes in group x equal two, you look if they belong to the same group in um, x equal one, so if they belong in, um, to the same group, the probability of belonging to the second group, uh, to the same block also in the second group is inflated by a factor gamma. That's it. So if you belong in the same group, uh, it, in, uh, to, the, in, uh, to the same block in group one, then you have an inflated probability to belong to the same block also in group two by a factor gamma. Otherwise, you just uh, have the usual uh, 
uh, Dirichlet process prior. So basically, this is a very common construction also in Bayesian and parametric, and it's been used for, uh, for, time barrier, for time series analysis, when you want to cluster individual across time. Here, you want to th think about clustering nodes across, uh, across uh, groups. And this is a, a nice example with gene expression data. Here you have a gene expression from two types of cancer, breast cancer and ovarian cancer. And you can see, so we try to see if there are shared groups between the two. Obviously, there are shared groups, but in ovarian cancer, the big central group is much, much stronger. The connection are much stronger than in the breast cancer group. And so you can make inference of, across groups. And uh, this is the end of my talk, so you don't have to worry. I'm not going to speak about all uh, all day. So I even took less than half an hour. So what I did today is to is to show you, sorry, a new a new an improved MCMC algorithm for posterior uh, inference on graph. Then we apply this algorithm to to recover large scale structure in graphical model by using both the standard uh, the stochastic block model as a prior on space of graph. And then also we have introduced uh, the Southern Italian community structure, which is slightly different. And we believe this is actually, there is a lot of interest nowadays in just estimating on focusing on big structure and not on single edges. We can extend this to multiple graph and also to many other setup. Now, this one, apparently my postdoc told me that nowadays paper are cited with the QR code. So he gave me the QR code of our paper. So this is, um, so the, the first paper is about the WWA and the second paper is about uh, the graph substructure. And basically I just put here, but uh, look, this is all references that I've put in the paper and here, just to give you an idea of how active this, uh, this area is. And thank you for listening, and sorry for my voice. Thank you, Maria, for the talk. Do we have some questions? Uh, are you taking into consideration the size of the graph? I can imagine that... Uh, it should be some optimal small graph is maybe not opt not good and, and very big graph is not so good. You mean the size of the graph in terms of number of edges? Yes, vertices edges. So most of the literature tries to shrink the number of edges because it goes through parsimony, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes you have a priori information on the size. You need to shrink in general because uh, because otherwise you get a lot of spurious edges. So you need to put prior yes, that. Some people that, take a huge graph and then prune it. Uh, we can do it through. So we don't prune it like this. So we do it through the prior that sense, the posterior probability of the edge inclusion quite small. So you, so standard approaches like in the first approaches in, in here, basically you they would put a prior on on the edge inclusion, probably on, on the edge inclusion, which is quite small so that you favor sparse graph. So sort of automatic pruning, shall we call it like that? Okay. So it's in the model, but we don't have to do that. So if I believe that my graph is very interconnected, I do not have to do that. I can actually introduce that information in the model. Like I want a graph with a lot of edges. Now, why you wanna do it depends on the application. So I can control in theory, the level of, um, sparsity I want in my graph in, in the graph. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Do we have any further questions? I'm sorry. Could be, yeah. Oh wow. That, that's quite good. I yeah. the... Thanks. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, can you please describe the the last two graphs? I, I would like to understand what's exactly the difference between uh, in, in this, uh, actually, it's more a shared structure, just the strength of connection, the gene expression data. Yeah, the, uh, the, no, the, the cancer one. The, the cancer, the, yeah, yeah, uh, the gene expression. So here, in reality, you're right. It's the, the They're quite uh, similar. But the reason why we chose this example, which maybe I should have said, 
this data come from a paper uh, like uh, uh, so so just to give you a bit more background okay so like, like are, how, how many groups are in the graph so uh, there are uh, i think there are uh, a bit uh, so here are much more differentiated so it's one two three four five six seven i think was the binder estimation here with seven groups okay for for this one here there is much more noise but the reason why we like this example now i don't remember all the details is that the original paper um, where we took uh, the data from had a nice uh, biological explanation of this gene module mm -hmm. and uh, our uh, reconstruction of the blocks correspond to the gene module so we had a sort of a ground truth to compare our estimation. But here you can see there is much less noise than here. Yeah, so yeah. it means some connections are, are broken. So because like some, maybe some genes are uh, under-expressed and over or, yeah, yeah. Or over under-expressed there in uh, ovarian. So it's not exactly the same thing. I see. Yeah, yeah but, but that's why I agree. It's not a striking example in terms of differences. But it's a good example because tell us that we're going, we're doing vaguely the right thing, which is already something. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Do we have any further questions? There's been online or anything. Anyway, let's uh, thanks to the speaker again. Let's thank both speakers. Thank you, Maria. So that's all the talks that we have for today. Uh, there will be a reception slash cocktails at five o'clock in building one and uh, with it followed by a poster session and an introduction by Brian Moran, our current Dean of Graduate Studies. So thanks again. <laughs>